We know who the 99% are. We are the 99%. But who's the 1%? The 1% is not just all rich people. The 1% are those who deliberately and intentionally use their power and wealth to rig the economy and co-opt the democratic process. We're going to show a video that lays out the story of the 1% and how we got here. It's kind of a whodunit. It's called Heist, Who Stole the American Dream? And it's a powerful documentary exposing the roots of the economic crisis. It shows how four decades of deregulation, massive job outsourcing, and tax policies favoring corporations and wealthy elites have brought us to where we are today. As you're watching the video, think about choices and power. What choices did individuals and institutions make at various points in our history? How did those choices build economic and political power, and power for whom? What choices could we make differently as a country? And what's left out of this story? Are there people who the economy never worked for? I'm here to show that moderate voices have a stake in this too. Massive job losses, record home foreclosures and evaluations, lost retirement savings. The mess we're in today did not begin on Wall Street. Long before the financial collapse, the dismantling of government regulation was well underway. This has been the greatest wealth transfer in the history, at least of um, American kind, if not mankind. This is class warfare. In a real-life development dwarfing the most elaborate conspiracy fiction, all of these consequences are the end result of a brilliantly executed coup. Everyday human lives, the common dreams of people everywhere, were never a factor. All that mattered was profit. Who did it? How were they able to pull it off right before our eyes? This is the story of the biggest heist in American history. My grandmother was born into the world of boom and bust, boom and bust, as it had been from 1794 until the Great Depression. Once upon a time, we knew in this country we had a Great Depression, and we had a stock market crash in 1929, followed by several years of 25% unemployment, of corporations declaring bankruptcy, of people in the streets on bread lines. I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. In the depths of the Great Depression, President Roosevelt's New Deal put millions back to work, provided unemployment insurance, created social security, and made it easier for workers to join unions and bargain collectively. What FDR and that government had the balls to do was enact legislation that really took command of the Wall Street environment and said, you know what, you can't speculate with other people's money. Coming out of the Great Depression, just three laws fundamentally altered 
the course of America's history. The first one, FDIC insurance, make it safe to put money in banks. The second one, Glass-Steagall, try to separate the risk taking on Wall Street from uh, your local community bank. And the third one, uh, SEC regulations uh, provide some cops to watch the robbers. Out of that, what we got was 50 years of economic peace. No financial panics, no meltdowns. And during that 50 years, we built a strong and prosperous middle class in America. The New Deal established that ordinary people had the right to protect themselves against corporate abuse. The early 70s expanded those safeguards with the creation of agencies like the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, whose mission was to protect workers. The Environmental Protection Agency was created to protect human health and the environment. Regulation is nothing more than the imposition of a set of rules to prevent the free market from behaving in a way which is contrary to the common good. A decision was reached by corporate America that working with unions, uh, working with government to improve the standard of living for all people was not the right thing to do. In 1971, corporate leaders began to orchestrate a detailed battle plan to eliminate any government policies that might stand between them and profits. The plan was laid out in an influential memo called Attack on American Free Enterprise System. Lewis Powell was a well-respected citizen of Richmond, Virginia. He was a corporate lawyer, a partner in a prestigious corporate law firm, and friends with uh, an executive at the Chamber of Commerce named Eugene Sidnor. And Sidnor asked his friend if he would draft a position statement that he could submit to the Chamber of Commerce that would then sort of form the framework for how to make the organization more able to confront what they thought was a, a growing threat to business interests. Powell's memo laid out a strategy to radically alter public perceptions, ensuring that big business interests would dominate public policy. Powell advocated a vast purge of liberal elements in society. He saw how corporate money could own the media and talk louder than organized labor and consumer protection groups. But for Powell, a future Supreme Court justice, the real end game was business control of law and politics you see this memorandum bouncing from desk to desk, from uh, boardroom to boardroom around corporate America, uh, inspiring and inciting uh, business leaders to find a way to get involved and to join what they had already, many of them had already perceived to be a battle for the soul of America and a battle to save free enterprise. Lewis Powell, the Powell Memo. Businessmen should use their financial muscle to shape the politics of the country nor should there be reluctance to penalize politically those who oppose it. By 1978, business outspent organized labor three to one to defeat a bill that would have made it easier for workers to join unions. This was a critical turning point, setting in motion the decline of organized labor as a major political force and the voice of working Americans. It all comes together in the election of 1980. Uh, where the right had built up this powerful political and financial and intellectual infrastructure, and it all comes together under Reagan. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. There's just no question that when Ronald Reagan came in, the target of Reaganomics was the labor movement. One of his first acts was to destroy the uh, air traffic controllers, which was a signal to all American businesses that it was open season on unionism. They are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. They understand that it's not just about labor supporting the interests of members of labor unions, but it has been the labor movement that has supported the interests of all workers. You wouldn't have Social Security, you wouldn't have unemployment compensation, you wouldn't have Medicare, you wouldn't have all of these things, which are not just for labor union members. As the bumper sticker says, they are the people who brought you the weekend.
he was able to pull off an ideological counter-revolution. And by the time he was over, uh, most of the New Deal had been dismantled. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. It was attacking government, attacking the institutions of government, and uh, trying to make it as a system that doesn't work. And uh, in, in reality, uh, rich folks don't need governments. They live in their own gated communities. They have their own security. They swim in their own swimming pools. They go to their own private schools. Rich people take care of themselves. While Reagan was breaking unions and demolishing regulations, he also convinced Congress in 1981 to pass his Economic Recovery Tax Act, cutting the top tax brackets by nearly a third, but raising taxes on the middle class. By dramatically increasing the Social Security tax, as recommended by Alan Greenspan to Ronald Reagan, we shifted the burden of government. So that today, 70-some percent of Americans pay a heavier share of their income in Social Security and Medicare taxes than they do in income taxes. And we push the burden down. At the same time, at the very, very top, we radically cut taxes so that the 1,000 richest men, women, and children in America face an effective total federal tax rate, Social Security and income taxes, about 17 cents on the dollar and their average income is $263 million. After decades of lobbying driven by corporate money, the tax code is now full of loopholes and special deals that help big business avoid paying its fair share. To avoid paying taxes, U.S. corporations have stashed more than $1.5 trillion in offshore accounts. Corporations only pay 13% of the federal budget's revenues. Out of $2.5 trillion, corporations only pay 13%. So I just want to list some 10, the 10 worst corporate tax avoiders. ExxonMobil, largest oil company in the world, made $19 billion in profits in 2009. Exxon not only paid no federal income taxes, it actually received a $156 million rebate from the IRS. Over the past five years, while General Electric made $26 billion in profits in the United States, it received a $4.1 billion refund from the IRS. So if you're working stiff, you're making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year, you're paying taxes, but if you're Chevron and you made $10 billion in profits in 2009, you don't have to pay any taxes, you get a $19 million refund. U.S. Steel is getting out of the steel business and they're getting out of this community. And they're saying, goodbye, we had enough, there's no more left, we squeezed the grape, we're going on to greener pastures. We've seen the acceleration of the hollowing out of America as the most important and powerful industrial society on Earth. Since 1973, approximately 40 million good-paying American jobs with benefits have been shipped overseas or dismantled by corporations, boosting their own profits at working Americans' expense. Thanks to decades of policy shaped by corporate money, there was nothing to stop them. Offshoring of employment has been with us for a very long time, but has mostly been restricted to manufacturing. The new wrinkle is offshoring of services, the number and range and variety of jobs that could, in principle, be done abroad, say, over the internet. It's enormous. It will be painful, and for a number of reasons. One of them is going to be large, maybe over the course of the next generation, 30, 40 million jobs. It's important to note, this is not either about only low-skilled jobs or only high-skilled jobs. They're all over. If what you do is write computer code, routine computer code, you lose nothing in quality if you move the job from Indiana to India. Where are the jobs for university graduates? They are now beginning to face the same dilemmas that blue-collar workers face when they lost their $20 an hour manufacturing jobs with their good benefits. And so we have an economy that is starting to impoverish its workforce. An infinite number of people coming who are taking jobs that pay over 100,000 a year 
you know, they're going to pay taxes. We create lots of other jobs around those people. You know, my, my basic view is that the country should welcome as many of those people as we can get. And what the corporations are doing, they tell Congress, oh, there's a shortage of engineers. There's a shortage of scientists. We can't find any. This is all an absolute total lie. Under Reagan, the mandate agenda included not only deregulation of Main Street industries, but the financial industry as well. This set the scene for a future disaster on a scale previously unimaginable. In 1933, Congress passed a law called the Glass-Steagall Act. And that law said, well, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out if allowing banks to invest in speculative securities brings down the banking system when the market fails then maybe we shouldn't let them do it. It was very simple. It maintained that commercial banks that were responsible for individuals, deposits, and savings, and lives were kept separate and were backed by the government from the more speculative, risky trading activities of the investment banking community. It works so well that people forget. And in 1999, a genius by the name of Phil Graham aided by a brilliant president named Bill Clinton who signed the bill, and pushed by a free market ideology that had been peddled to the United States people since the day Ronald Reagan was elected, said, we don't need Glass-Steagall anymore. We haven't had bank panics. Glass-Steagall was the longest lived and most successful financial law ever passed, protecting consumers and investors alike. Within a year of Glass-Steagall's repeal in 1999, President Clinton signed the deceptively named Commodity Futures Modernization Act, deregulating shadowy financial products known as derivatives. One of those instruments, known as the credit default swap, became the prime culprit in the 2008 worldwide financial crisis. Wall Street paid their chief executives hundreds of millions of dollars for screwing us up and losing our money. And we paid him a huge premium for this. We said, boy, these are really smart guys. They're not smart guys. You and I would never have made those loans. What we've seen over the last 30 years is a deliberate transfer of wealth from middle class and the poor to the very wealthiest people in our country. The game is fundamentally rigged and that ordinary people who do everything right, who play by the rules, still end up with a short end of the stick. I don't think people have a good understanding of how low weight incomes are in America from work. One third of jobs in America pay less than $15,000 a year. Now, that includes part-time workers and people with two small jobs. But half make less than 25,000. Three quarters make less than 54,000. 99% make less than $250,000. In reality, working Americans have been pushed to rely on credit to make up for the lack of growth in wages even as corporate profits skyrocketed. Wages have stagnated since 1973, despite increased worker productivity. Instead, the benefits of Americans' hard work have gone to executives and shareholders. What does the Bible denounce? The Old Testament, the New, and the Koran, all of them denounce again and again and again with a really powerful word, denounce as evil it is taking from those with less to give to the rich. Folks who were in charge of running this economy ran red light after red light after red light and caused car wreck after car wreck after car wreck, and no one's held them accountable. There hasn't even been a conversation about accountability. Now, incredibly, the government tells companies to police themselves. The Justice Department's current position is that a company can escape criminal prosecution if they just promise to change their behavior. You would think that Congress would say, who caused it? Who are we gonna hold accountable? Are people going to jail? 
Where's the prosecution? You would think that would have happened, right? It hasn't happened. As of 2011, not one corporate CEO, bank executive, or politician has been criminally prosecuted for crimes leading to the economic meltdown of 2008. If you really did the investigation, uh, the Democrats would not be able to simply say, oh, it was those, that, that George W. Bush, it was him. Well, you know what? It was a lot of Bush. But I'm afraid the Republicans would be able to say, sorry, not just us. Uh, Take a look at Rob Rubin, Secretary of Treasury under Bill Clinton and all of the Rubin guys. They were working with Alan Greenspan. They were working with Phil Graham to deregulate all of this stuff. So you got true bipartisanship. Everybody wants bipartisanship? You got it. We didn't actually clean up Wall Street. We actually didn't slay the beast. <laughs> we actually put them on life support and they've been off healing and mending themselves and doing quite well. Everybody was shocked by Hurricane Katrina and by the, 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 you know, these images of poor African-Americans and other people uh, abandoned, st you know, stuck on rooftops, waving American flags for two, three, four days, holding babies without a drop of water, without the U.S. government, the, the richest country in the world, being able to get them a scrap of food after three, four, five days. People were shocked, and it was shocking. But what nobody wanted to address was, it was the logical, necessary, inevitable outcome of 30 years of public policy that both parties had championed, saying, if you're poor, you're on your own. If you're poor, sink or swim. Uh, it, it, and it's better for you. It's morally right that we won't help you if you're poor. You should pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and if you can't cut it, you should be left to sink or swim. There are only two kinds of power in America. There's organized money and there's organized people. One thing is really clear, the powerful corporate interests have had it good for so long, they're not gonna let go without a fight. And I think that we have to be very clear about that and ready to fight back. And I say we fight back with organizing, we fight back with good policy, and we fight back with, with strategies that are about achieving victory. People are beginning to experiment with challenging in the populist way, challenging the bailouts, challenging the huge payouts. These are beginning signs that people are waking up slowly. And I call it evolutionary reconstruction, building from the bottom, challenging at the top, aware, I think, and this is critical, that this is not just an election, this is not, quote, a revolution. This is a long-term rebuilding of the entire basis of a system. And that's a hard thing for people to grasp, that that might be where we're at. Let's never surrender. Let's never surrender. This video makes clear that our shared suffering and the squeeze we're all feeling is no accident. It's the result of a systematic power grab by a few in the 1% to increase their own power and wealth at our expense. The strategy behind that power grab looks like this. The first piece of the 1% strategy is to weaken workers by attacking unions and collective bargaining to drive down wages and benefits. The 1% can't stand unions. That's because collective bargaining has historically meant better wages and a bigger share of our collective wealth, not just for union members, but for workers in general. And that threatens the 1%'s control over our workplaces and our economy. The second piece of the 1% strategy is to attack our democracy. 
One way that they've done that is by systematically and relentlessly attacking every single government program that benefits the 99%, from Social Security to Medicare to nutrition assistance to the Environmental Protection Agency to Pell Grants for college students. Less government oversight led directly to the predatory lending practices and mortgage fraud that have caused so much damage to our communities. The 1% attacks on government haven't stopped them from trying to buy it up, though. And now, because of the perverse idea that corporations are people with free speech rights, the US Supreme Court and Citizens United has ruled that they can spend unlimited amounts of money to influence elections. And to make it that much harder for the 99% to assert ourselves at the polls, the 1% are trying to take away from many the most basic democratic right of all the right to vote. So the attack on workers and the attack on democracy are two different ways that those with money can suppress the many. But there's one final piece of the 1% strategy, and that's the time-honored method of divide and conquer. It means appealing to racism and homophobia. For example, the scapegoating of Latin American immigrants, Muslims, and others is part of the 1% strategy to distract us from the real culprits. They use the courts, prisons, political and educational systems to keep these groups locked out of our economy. And while some of us are only recently losing access to economic opportunity, the divide and conquer strategy has been used for ages to keep some groups from ever accessing the American dream. People of color, indigenous peoples, low-income people, women, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer, plus other groups have been assaulted by the 1% strategy. Attack unions, attack democracy, trash the planet, keep the poor locked out, demonize immigrants, divide and conquer, keep us isolated. That's the 1% strategy. The result? Today, only 1% of the population hold almost half of our country's wealth. And that's why this is what our economy looks like today. Now, we know the 1% have money power, but the good news is we have power too. The 1% need us. They need our consumer dollars and they need our labor. They need our taxes. When elections roll around, they need our votes for candidates who support their interests. Most of all, they need our consent to the status quo. What stories are missing from the story in the film? Are there people who the economy never worked for? What choices got us to this point as a country? What choices could we make differently as a country? What choices do we make as individuals to maintain the status quo? And what resources are we giving the 1% every day? What choices could we make differently?